Okay, good evening. This is Tom Schoen. I'm a senior consultant with Eaglet uh, I, the makers of the iSurface Profiler, uh, where I'm wearing my hat most of the time, and then occasionally I wear my hat as a BNL consultant helping David Bland in the SVP group. Um, so this evening is uh, a webinar on the iSurface Profiler. We've got a great bunch of people that are going to help us out with that. So I'll get things kicked off. I'll walk you guys through the agenda. And then Ilsa Flux, the in-house OD uh, at Eaglet out in uh, Holland, in Utrecht, Holland, will walk you through uh, a bunch of examples, how to use the software, how to take an image, the principles behind profilometry, so on and so forth. And then she's going to kick it over to Dr. Barry Leonard. Barry Leonard is a real-world ESP user. You guys probably know Barry, but uh, he's, uh, he's based in the LA area. And he's at the ESP for about two years now. So he's going to talk to you about how he actually uses that in a practice and then uh, go through one of his cases. So uh, let's walk through the agenda. Ilsa Flux is going to review the ESP technology profilometry, how we acquire an image, how we use an image, elevation maps, tangential maps, lens design integrations. Examples of keratoconus, examples of pinguecula and microvolting or notching, uh, and a couple other examples. And then uh, also make sure that you understand that this is a corneal and corneal scleral topographer. So we'll uh, try to show you a little bit about how this could uh, actually replace your corneal topographers, not just a corneal scleral instrument. Then Barry's going to kick, uh, kick off. Uh, he'll talk about how he uses the ESP. Uh, he'll talk about his share time savings, which I think is substantial, generally speaking. And uh, um, he'll talk about his first fit success rate. We'll talk a little bit about complex cases, and then he'll review his case report. So with that, uh, so I'll come back. Uh, when Barry's done, I'll talk quickly about uh, reviewing the lens designs that we currently have in the uh, software, the number of algorithms we have. It's over 30 lens designs. Most of the, most of the popular sclerals uh, are certainly included, some hybrids, some ortho Ks, some specially soft. Uh, we'll review key partner labs. That'll be part of the discussion as well. And then we'll review the key benefits with the, with the acquisition of an Eaglet iService profiler. And at any point in time, you should type questions that you have as, as they pop up. Unfortunately, we can't open up the stage to you know 60 people. Uh, but type a question and we'll do our best to answer it. We'll include a follow-up email that includes a link to the recorded webinar. So if you don't catch it all or you want to review it, you'll have that link. Uh, and let me know. You'll have my email a little later on. But let me know how uh, how we can follow, best follow up, what your interest levels are, and what would be the appropriate next steps. So at this point, I will turn it over to Ilsa. So you should be able to hear me right now. Uh, my screen name you can see up there is Arnett Snapfanger. So that's not me, but I'm logged in as him. So my name is Ilse Flux. I'm gonna try and get my PowerPoint up there. I'm just gonna look at Tom really quick if, I, if he can see it right now. Okay, see if I can make that larger for you guys. Mm. Ah, there you go. Uh, so welcome to our webinar where we have a little issue with getting Dr. Barry Leonard on stage. Um, so Dr. Leonard, if you that says go on stage, if you click that one, uh, we should be able to put you on stage later on so people can hear you. Um, so there's a chat box available for you guys as well. If you have any questions or if I'm going too fast, please type your message in there. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the chat. If, if any question pops up, we'll, we'll answer it right away for you. Um, so just to start off, I'm going to do a quick introduction about the device we have, uh, which is called the iSurface Profiler and how it works. So basically, the technology behind the device is profilometry. And what we do, we have one digital camera in the middle, which you can see up here, and two projectors on the right-hand side. 
So what happens, those projectors project a line pattern on the eye from two angles on, in which it completely covers the eye, as you can see on the image below over here. So normally when you take any measurement of the cornea, you can only measure up the cornea because that's the only part of the eye that is a reflective surface. That's the, that's the reason why we install fluorescein. So we install fluorescein so that whole eye becomes a reflective surface and we're also able to measure the sclera. So due to the installation of the fluorescein molecule and the line patterns we project on the eye, the whole ocular surface becomes a reflective area. And we get data on the whole eye uh, that we can gather and get into something for you to read. So we, we get that data and we translate it for you guys into sagittal height data. So the process of doing this is really fast. It takes about two milliseconds. Um, there's no hole in the data. As you can see, it's completely covered from light to ref. And it's an equal density across the surface. So then the next step is we're projecting this light pattern and what are we gonna do with it? So the next step is Fourier transform technology. So what happens, we're projecting those line patterns on the right side and the left side and a photo is taken, an image is taken. So that right channel and that left channel is getting processed individually by something we call Fourier transform technology. Um, this process is really, really complicated. It contains all sorts of calculations. I can try and explain that to you guys, but it probably doesn't make any sense and I wouldn't know what I'm saying. So just believe me on this. A very hard calculation is, is processing uh, and it's getting the data uh, from the line patterns into a 3D image, which we can see over here and over on the right hand side. This image created is directly sagittal height. So it's not showing curvature, it's showing sagittal height data. Um, please let me know if there's any questions about the technology behind this device. So just a quick summary, we project two line patterns on the eye. Due to the fluorescein, we get a reflection of the complete eye and the data gathered from the line patterns is then translated into a 3D image of the eye, directly into sagittal height. So what can we do with this information? Uh, we're able to measure up 20 millimeter of the eye, horizontal and vertically, as you can see up here, which contains about half a million data points. Uh, so like I said, we directly measure sagittal height and the topography image is based on fluorescein that you put into the eye. If you compare this directly to a, a topographer such as a Metmont, the accuracy of the corneal area is, is very high, so it's very comparable. Um, we have about a two micron accuracy of the cornea, and we've got about a 10 micron accuracy on the scleral part. So with this device, we're able to measure scleral lenses, soft lenses, RGP and ortho K lenses. In addition, we are lab independent. So every manufacturer is able to work with us. Um, currently, we've got seven labs in our system uh, with up to 30 lens algorithms available. Um, so the reason we wanna know is, since your guys, or most of the guys watching right now are ODs, you know how important it is to measure as far out as possible. So this is research done by Dr. Jerry Ledgerton, and he was measuring the ocular shape. So if you go to the middle of this image, that is the top of the cornea. And the further you go out, the further you get into the sclera. So we draw a cord length over here at about 14 millimeters. So of course your regular topographer can probably not measure 14 millimeters out. So what they've done, they measured this point and they measured it over and over and over again. And they saw a variance of three millimeters, which is about 3000 microns which means that if you start extrapolating data, you're gonna get diversity around that 14 millimeter point. Um, imagining what if you're measuring up to 17 millimeter, that diversity is gonna go even bigger. Um, but lucky for us with the device we have, we're able to actually measure that far. So we're not extrapolating, we're getting actual data on that part of the eye. So this slide is just in there to show you guys how important it is to, to gather actual data and don't start extrapolating. So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna quickly go over taking a measurement. So how does our device works? Uh, of course, this is a little bit simplified. In reality, it's a little bit more complicated. So the first step we advise to do is, is align your device. So the alignment of the device is based on, on two points. 
First off, there are two horizontal reflections in the middle of the eye, which you can see over here. These are Purkinje dots. So if you look really closely to the image, you can see two smaller red circles. You want to make sure those two are aligned on the Purkinje dots. If you have done that, you can see that's a well-centered image. Testing, testing. Um, so, if, so if you've got the two aligned here in the middle, you've got the center of the eye and you're going to get a nice centered image. The other thing you want to do is there are two vertical reflections up here. You want to make sure those are aligned in a vertical straight line. If they're not aligned, it means that you're either too close or too far away of the eye, which is going to end up in a not a very accurate measurement. So you want to make sure these two are aligned as well. These two dots over here are the most important ones. If your image is not completely centered, that's not a really big issue. So that's so far as the alignment of the device. The next step you want to do is install as much fluorescein as better. Uh, we believe there's not a such thing as too much fluorescein. So you're going to grab a fluo strip, you're going to put a lubricant drop on there and just completely cover that eye orange. So it's just completely painted all over the eye. As you can see on the image below, it's completely painted in orange. That's how we know we've got, we're, we're able to take a good measurement. So the last step you want to do, and this is very important if you want to get that 20 millimeters wide, is you want to open up that eyelid as far as possible. So you want to make sure, I'm hearing an echo. There you go. So you want to make sure that the eyelids are wide open as possible and you want to get that upper eyelid all the way to the brow bone. over my screen right now and I'm going to show you how it looks when you actually get a measurement so after you've done those three steps you've taken a measurement an image like this is going to show up this is what we call the bisphere elevation map and just remember it's sagittal height so the thing you see over here is sagittal height and not curvature so the way you should read this map uh, just give me a quick second. All right, we're just going to make sure. Am I on? Yeah, there yeah. you go. So, uh, in case you haven't noticed yet, we're now Ilsa's Lime on the Eaglet software. We're not in PowerPoint anymore. So, turn to the live, live software so I can play around and click on the buttons. Um, so, just to give a quick overview of this image, everything that's red is more elevated. Everything that's green or blue means it's more depressed. So if you have an image like this, um, there are a couple of things you want to look at. The first thing is you want to see how the scaling is up here. So as we see, we've got an image of about, let's say, 18, 19 millimeters wide. And I say we've got the similar scaling vertically. So this is what we would consider a good image. Um, so the next thing you can do after you've looked at this image is see what kind of lens you want to fit on here. Um, so say this is a patient with a normal eye, it's not diseased, but what if you want to decide to fit a scleral lens on there? You can clock on one of the algorithms we have available, which you can see over on the left-hand side. So for instance, in this case, um, I'm a little bit curious, I want to put a one-fit on there. I just click the one-fit algorithm to give it a couple of seconds it's going to load up the suggestion for the one fit lens. So right now it's telling you to order a full or uh, a BCR of 8.6. And it's also showing you that there's no touristy in the landing zone because it's going for an SD2 on both touristy angles. So if you want to check that, you can go back to the results screen. Uh, so we were putting a one fit on there with I think a 14.9 millimeter. So what I can do right now is I can go through the court length and type in 14.9. So right now, it's going to give me all the information of a court length of 14.9. The things to look at over here is the 360 value and the min sag and the maximum sag. So the 360 degree value is going to give you the average digital height of a court length at 14.9 millimeters. 
The other thing you want to consider or look at is the minimum sagittal height and the maximum sagittal height. You want to know the, what is the difference between there. As you can see, it's about 100 microns. Um, so in that case, I won't advise to go to a scleroptoric landing zone. I'd say go for a scleroptoric landing zone if you're above 150 microns difference. And in this case, we are around 130. So the system, the algorithm is going to suggest a standard landing zone, a spheric landing zone, uh, just like that one fit lens was doing that we showed earlier on. Does anyone have any questions about this example? All right, so since it's, you guys don't have any questions, you're all paying attention, I'm, I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult for you. So I've got another example lined up over here. Uh, and there's one thing that really stands out in this image, which is that central red area we have over here. Um, so this is a keratoconic patient. It has a central red elevation right in the middle of the eye. The other thing that we can see over here is that there is a red markation on the sclera up on that edge. And over here, it seems like it's more blue. So we would expect toricity in the landing zone this time. We would expect a toric sclera. This is because it's more depressed down here. And it looks more elevated, more red on that area. So of course, there's a way we can check that. Um, in this case, I'm just going to click on a 16 Zen lens, a prolate lens. And we're going to see what it's suggesting. So right now it's telling to go for a sagittal height of 4,700. And also it's predicting a toric landing zone. About four steps. So what we can do now is we can go back to that result page. And we can check that. So in this case, I'm going to type in a cord length of 16 millimeter. And I'm going to see what information is coming out of it. So if we go to the toricity right away. We can see there is a difference of about 120 microns. Um, in the case of a Zen lens, we do suggest toricity. So there's a 120 microns difference. Each Zen lens APS step is a value of about 30 microns. So if we divide that through each other, we would think about four steps. Four steps in toric APS, which is what the algorithm was suggesting. So now if I go back to the Zenland Prolate, I can see there's four steps of toricity in here. The other thing we can check is the average sagittal height, which is 4,700. If I go back to the result page and I type in that 16 again, the next thing I want to look at is the average sagittal height up here. The average sagittal height at 360 degrees. So we can see that's 4.35. So we know from the Zen lens uh, guidelines, we want to add about the 350 microns, of which 100 microns is for the settling, and the other 200, the other 250 microns is because because you want to have some vaulting, you want to have some clearance when you put that lens on. So you're gonna add 350 microns. I hope everybody is understanding why we add 350. So in that case, we wouldn't end up with the 4,700 sagittal height, which is exactly what our algorithm is predicting as well. Um, so this is in the case of a keratoconic patient. Does anyone have questions about this one? If you do, just send us a quick note in the chat box. All right, so of course I've got more examples for you prepared. Um, I think a lot of you are, are known with creating a notch in your lens or a microfold. Uh, one fit calls it a recess. If you look at this image, you can see there is a red elevation up in this area, right where my square is. Uh, that is a pink wecula. And of course, it would be really awesome if we know the exact location of, of where this bump is on the sclera. Uh, and we can actually measure that. So I'm going to enlarge this screen a little bit. I'm going to move my mouse over here and I'm going to lock it. There you go. So I've got this box showing here, which is right on top of the pink wecula that I've just shown. So in case of ordering a microfold lenses, uh, a lens with a microfold, I need some information. I need to know where the exact location is. I need to know how, how high this pink wecula is. Um, so if you look at this little box over here, Right on top, it's saying 217. 
So the height of this microvolt is 217 micron. So if I'm going to order a microvolt, I want to have it at a height of 217. Just because you want to lay it over and a microvolt or a pink wecula is a soft tissue, we recommend to distract about 50 microns just to make sure it's nicely laying over the pink wecula. So in this case, we would probably order it at 360 microns high. The other thing we want to know is the exact location. So over here, I've got this real little number that's saying 350, which means this mic, this pink wecula is located at 350 degrees. The other thing I want to know is how far is it away from the apex. So that's located next to the axis. It's 7.72 millimeters away from the apex. So there's only one thing I want to find out now, and then we have all the information that is the width of this pink wakela. So to do that, unfortunately, I have to start moving my mouse a little bit. So I'll delete this screen. If you go all the way at the top, I'm going to look at the Y value right now. So over here, that's 0.09. I hope you can read my bad handwriting. And if I move it all the way at the bottom, I'll lock my screen again for you. It's 2.30. Let's make it 30. So that means in this case, uh, I want to start ordering a microvolt with a width of 1.40 millimeters. I hope that makes sense to everybody. If you still have questions about this and you don't want to ask it right now, feel free to shoot us an email after. Um, so this ends me with my last example, which is a little bit more complicated, but I'm assuming you're all paying really close attention right now. So. I'm going to explain to you how to recognize a quadrant to specific order. So how, um, how your image is going to look like when you might need to order a quad specific lens. So if you look at this eye right now, it's looking quite normal. You might suspect a little bit of scleral toricity. Because over here it looks a little bit more blue. Over there it looks a little bit more red. Uh, for the people that are really paying attention, if you look at this center area up here, we notice that it's a quite a large, large flattening. So we're not seeing that center red. This is because this patient is wearing ortho K lenses. Uh, so that's how you can kind of recognize an ortho K wearer based on sagittal height data. But I wasn't going to talk about ortho K. I was going to show you guys how you can see if an eye needs a quad specific lens. So in this case, I'm just going to move over to another map which is the tangent angle map, which is showing you guys the tangent angle taken from the top. Um, so if you look at this, you can notice a very large green area in this section, which means it's lower compared to the rest of it. So what I'm interested in right now, and what is the difference between this section and this section, if you want to order a quad specific? We've got a little tool for that. You can basically just grab this meridian and drag it around. So right now I'm seeing that this is around 44 degrees. Let's make it 45. If I go back to the bisphere elevation map right now, I'm going to drag that meridian into the same direction. So we were saying around 45 degrees. Um, depending on what diameter lens I want to order, I'm going to type in that chord length again. So in this case, Let's go for a 16 again. So now what I'm going to look at is the comparison between the temporal sagittal height and the nasal sagittal height, which is this area and this area up there. So everything on the left side of this eye is nasal. Everything on the right-hand side is the temporal side. As you can see up down below, it is showing up with a difference of about 600 microns, 590 microns. So that means there's a difference in that nasal section and the temporal section of 590 microns, which is a lot. So when I see a difference like that, in my case, I would suggest ordering a quad specific lens. Um, I know ZenLens has, has them available currently. Um, possibly uh, OneFit is working on that as well. Um, so this is an indication on how to see if you maybe need a quad specific order. So I've been running through my examples right now. If I'm going a little bit too fast for you, feel free to shoot me an email after and, and I'm happily explaining a little bit more stuff. 
Um, so by me ending up my examples, I, I want to go to the, over to Dr. Leonard, which I think has been on stage now. Uh, so we're going to see if we can get his PowerPoint up and running, and uh, I'm going to hand over the microphone to him. Dr. Leonard. Dr. Leonard. Are you able to hear me? Yes, uh, yes. you can speak up a little bit. It might help. It might help. Okay. Good. I'm glad it's live. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right, so give me a quick second, and I'll I'll make sure I'll I'll get your PowerPoint on the screen. Uh, yes, but it looks like you're not on stage anymore. Um, all right, so technical issues. Give me a couple of seconds. We'll make sure we get everything okay. Um, so you're not viewing your screens. Sure now. So, Tommy, you click on your PowerPoint right now. Okay. All right. So, Dr. Leonard, there's your PowerPoint. Go ahead. Very good. Hello, everybody, all over the world, wherever you are. Uh, <laughs> I've been using the uh, the Eaglet profiler now, like I said, for almost a couple of years. And uh, for me, I, I do a lot. I myself am keratoconic also. So I understand the problems all my patients go through and what it takes to get a good lens. But um, this has been a real game changer for me um, using the instrument. And this case that we're going to present, I really think uh, shows why. And uh, there's a gentleman here, a 37-year-old male that was wearing some scleros that I had fit him uh, three or four years ago and had got lost and now returned. And there are some lenses I fit, you know, now I call the old fashioned way, doing pretty good. But he came in saying, hey, a little blurry at night. After four to six hours, my eyes get a little red and tired and it's pretty hard to see, you know, driving. Um, he was at that point in his lenses getting about 20, 25 minus with a front toric scleral lens. So we, we checked those and looked at them and said, hey, I think we can we can do better. So one thing we did learn was, you know, he's got lenses on. And that, of course, would affect uh, doing the, the measurements at that point. So we have to have them, our patients then cut, return one morning. It usually works out the best. So they take their lenses out at night, come in without the lenses on eight or ten hours. And we seem to get some good data that way. And they just have to somehow figure out how to get here without uh, without their lenses on. He was best vision with glasses was about 2100. So it'd be a little hard to drive. So here in front of you, you can see the uh, eaglet uh, measurements that we got on both eyes. And what uh, he's, as you can see, even in there, or if we had the topography that you're all used to, he has sort of these inferior nipple type cones. And we were able to design new lenses, which then when he returned to cut to the chase, he was like, wow, much better. I can see better, less deposits. My eyes are white and clear. And we were able to, here you can see some of the OCT imaging of the lens. And the, the beauty of the eaglet at that point is, you know, we, we get those measurements that we saw before and we're able to pull a diagnostic lens out of the box that is going to be the diagnostic lens to start with. And you know, most of you in the past, it take him sometimes the third or fourth diagnostic lens just to find the correct sagittal height. So you put that lens on, we're able to then look at it, judge the sagittal height, what's left, do an over refraction and, and go ahead and order our lens. In this case, the biggest difference was that toric periphery that we were able to to get right on, which before he just had standard uh, edges. And what this did, besides making his eyes whiter, healthier, more comfortable, he no longer needed a front toric also because now you have the lens that's sitting better and he's able to achieve 20-20 vision versus his 25 minus and a much better product at the end. So the there's the the keys to it are similar to what we were going through before is how to get a good measurement which uh, is a, a pretty quick learning curve and uh patients love it you'll love it because 
this was a case of another one of one and done. I look back at some of my old uh, work trays and there could be three or four pairs of lenses before we got the final one. And now that's you. That's one you. pair, sometimes a, a one eye or both eyes need a little tweak. And generally those are, you know, what, how much is a lens going to settle? Um, some people settle a hundred microns, some it could settle 200 microns, some it could settle 50. And also if you do, we don't do a toric, front torque initially and sometimes you do have to add that little residual still in later um, or micro vaults or some things that you might not want to do on that first lens. Barry, I have a few questions for you um, and I'm going to go back to, to, to the imaging as I think that's a, a better slide, uh, more just slide. Um, so uh, we like to talk about Brian Tompkins study uh, in the UK for us. He's bit, I think, 42 eyes. Uh, retrospectively fit 42 eyes to see what the software algorithms, how, what his, his success rate was going to be. And he was hitting about 85%. Do you, uh, do you agree with that? And you think that you're in that uh, ballpark with your practice? Yeah. I think First fit success rate. That one and done is, is getting pretty high. Um, I haven't measured it. Yeah. Seat of the pants. I'd say we're probably somewhere up in the 75%. And then I say where we do sometimes that tweak will be, you know, like here you can see over on the left side of the screen, that's a perfect example of that toricity of that sclera at those sort of 45 yeah. degrees. So where exactly does that lens, you know, land? If we do lend, then I'm going to be adding that micro vault and things on that could be that second lens, but it's those small things that we're going to accomplish. And the neat part is you put that lens on the eye and that flat meridian rise lines up exactly who, where, the, where you would predict from the uh, profilometry. Well, that's great, and I, 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 um, I assume that you were probably in the two to three fit stage before you got your ESP when you had to do it old school, right? You were two, two or three refits. Two to three on a good day, you know. Yeah, okay. There'd be four or five lenses in there because the first lens was was sort of a seat of the pants, almost a diagnostic lens that you're ordering almost at that point, and then working okay. from there. So now you're right, right off the bat. So I'm going to guess you're you're now able now able to see more scleral patients. Uh, than ever before with that kind of increase in, in chair time or decrease in chair time. Correct. Much, much better, you know, less chair time in here, much better experience for the patient. I mean, they all might love me, but how much time do they really want to spend in my office? Okay. Thank you. And uh, for the folks listening at home, that wasn't a prompted conversation. That was, uh, that was honest. So uh, Barry, is there anything else you want to uh, review or should I jump into the, um, the, the benefits. I think that's that's it. The other, which I think I mentioned, you know, that getting that first diagnostic lens on the eye from whatever kit you have, that's you, with your 30 lenses, you were able to find yeah. those or designing it yourself and, and getting that lens on from some other company. That right away is a big difference. Then looking at the lens on the eye and seeing, does that match? Does that look like yeah. I need flat three there? Does it look like I need steep? Yeah, it does. And let's go ahead and get it. And it, and it works. Right. So we've done, Ilsa and I have done three installs this week. And uh, what I'm telling folks is that, you know, you're going to want to obviously put the closest diagnostic lens the, 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 to the ESP prediction on the eye, uh, ultimately for the, for the over-refraction. But uh, as you first get going and your confidence builds, you're going to want to double check that, uh, that you know, we're, we're headed in the right direction. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're st uh, still going to need to at least put one lens on the eye to do an over-refraction until... Uh, until Arnie figures out how to uh, take through a refraction with this instrument. All right. <laughs> but, oh, uh, Arnie. Oh, Arnie. All right. Well, uh, Barry, thank you very much. And jump in uh, if you uh, add or disagree with anything I'm going to say here. But uh, I want to summarize the presentation and where we are, I think, with Eaglet in the U.S. particularly. I know scleral lenses have taken off. Uh, my, my time at Alden, uh, we watched that happen, and then we got very involved in 2014. So... I, I know it sort of firsthand. You guys know it firsthand. I know it's semi firsthand. Um, and they're solving a tremendous amount of problems for a wide variety of patients. But chair time is going to be a big issue. Uh, and, you know, old school floor scene and, and evaluating lens fit and, you know, making a, a best guess judgment call, ordering a first lens, putting that lens on, making another tweak. You know, I think that uh, my personal opinion is that that is in the next three or five years is going to be a thing of the past. 
and I call it instrumentated fitting. It's going to evolve into instrument-based fitting, and I think that things are really going to move forward. We've got a lot of patients uh, to work with and help. Uh, one of the reasons Bausch bought Alden was uh, because that they saw the underserved uh, segment of the market um, and uh, and wanted to help grow it. So anyway, um, I would encourage you guys to think about it this way, and that's invest 10 minutes up front to increase your accuracy, decrease your reliance on limited uh, diagnostic lenses. You know, in, in any event, it's going to be a small set or representative set. You're going to cut down chair time and office time, save lens remakes, and save your patients' times. So from a technical standpoint um, versus other approaches to instrument-aided fitting, the eaglet eye is one shot and done. Um, you take the whole image with one shot. Now, if you have the patient there and you put fluorescein in the eye, you're going to want to probably zap three three shots, but there's no stitching. Um, there's no nothing like that. So one shot will take the entire up to 20 millimeter uh, image capture per eye. Uh, Eaglet is lab agnostic. In other words, we're lab neutral, and that means that uh, we feature over 30 lenses uh, at the moment, and that list is growing. We'll work with anybody who's willing to work with us, and uh, we're not promoting one lab over another. So if I happen to mention Alden more than once, to give me give me a little bit of uh, a break. <laughs> um, that's how I know this global market. So the di device resolution and performance has been peer reviewed. We'd be happy to send those those articles out and let you guys uh, investigate whether what we're saying is reasonably true. And uh, also things that we forget. Often, Ilsa and I don't talk enough about is the fact that this can do what a, anything a standard coronal topographer can do. We we focus on scleral lens fitting and uh, and speeding that up, and you know helping you guys with the massive increase in scleral lens demand. And uh, we miss the point. This is a, this is also a very very good state of the art standard coronal topographer. So. Uh, the acquisition steps, if you remain interested after this webinar, is let's get all your questions answered. Uh, we, we'll be happy to follow up on email with any questions that you have. With uh, Next step would be to ask for a quote. Um, then uh, we'd ask you to sign the quote. That's a commitment to purchase. We'll turn around, send you an invoice, and schedule an installation. Uh, this week, it's been Ilsa and I. Uh, in November, it's probably going to be Ilsa and or Arnie and I. And then uh, we'll just uh, we'll try to schedule things out. And so we set aside better part of a day uh, to actually set the unit up, which doesn't take more than 15 minutes. Uh, connect it to your computer, put, set it on your table, whatever. Uh, then we'll train your staff, uh, and we'll train when we'll train your staff at your uh, at your convenience. So if you've got patient load and people have to float in and out, that's fine. If you can dedicate staff, that's fine too. Uh, and we'll even even hang out and be in the wings if you want to. Uh, work on a couple, three patients. So what we've done in the past is had uh, two or three keratoconic patients lined up after about two hours of uh, training with your team. And we, we let you guys take over and uh, we hang out in the wings and jump in when needed. Uh, so the installation, we'll find a mutual date and we'll dedicate most of the day, as I mentioned. Uh, and the follow-up uh, will be, uh, will be answered very quickly. This is after the installation and we're always available. This is always available. We're a small company. We want to make this thing work right and uh, make yeah, sure you're happy. I, this is Barry, I uh, can jump in again with with that is that that whole process was wonderful. I mean, we all buy equipment and some experiences are better than the other, but A, having you know Arnie out here for the whole day was unbelievable. Um, and anytime we have a question, you know, which in the beginning a little bit, you know, what are the tricks of how do you get a better measurement and what does this mean? You guys have been there every, every moment to help us, which I appreciate. And the other is what you touched on is other specialty lenses. You know, you have ortho K in there, which we didn't talk about, which has been a big help. And also just other lenses, not wanting to know that HVID and pupil size. I realized how far off I was with my little ruler gauge. So it helped a lot in all that stuff. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I, will, I appreciate that. I'm going to break in real quick as well. Um, Tom, uh, you woke up a little bit when you were talking about the invoicing. So I'm not sure. I think uh, Michael is asking uh, if you could repeat that quickly again. Okay. So the, 
Okay, so the, the acquisition steps are, uh, you know, get your questions answered, then ask for a quote. We'll send a quote. If you sign it, that that's uh, a little bit of a commitment to purchase. Turn that around in an invoice. Uh, you, you then are going to be able to use the invoice to go out and get, uh, to get a, a financing, help you with the financing. The, uh, Eaglet is a small company. We don't, uh, unfortunately, don't get involved in that with you guys. Um, uh, in other words, you will source the funds. <laughs> that's, that's my bullet point. And uh, we can suggest some lenders that we've worked with in the U.S., but um, but that's on 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 your uh, on your dime. And uh, then once we get there, we'll schedule the installation. Uh, we'll find a mutual date. It works for uh, for everybody, and we'll uh, we'll dedicate most of it to you. Did that answer your question? I'm I'm gonna jump in and answer some other questions that have been asked. Um, which is if I, what lens what lens labs and algorithms we have available so far. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen really quick. All right, see if I can put that up. Um, I'm not sure if this is visible for you guys right now. Yes, it um, So I'm just going to... There you go. I'm just going to look at Tom's laptop. He's going to pull it up real quick. But there you go. This is the lenses we currently have available, and it's still growing. Um, this is the list we made last June, and I can already tell you that we've had a small Italian company added to this list, which they are called Soleco. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview. We've got RGPs, OrthoK, soft lenses, hybrids, and scleral lenses. If you want to have a closer look at it, we're happy to send you this list after. And then the other question was asked was about what lubricant we recommend using. It's called uh, sodium hyaluronate acid, which I think uh, is in the blink drops, which are easily available here in the US. The other one that we recommend, we quite often use, is called Hylocomod, uh, which I'm not sure is available in the US, but I know you can get it from Canada. Uh, so there is a way to get your hands on it over here. Um, so I'm hoping that answers the questions as well. Do you have any other stuff that's coming up? Um, we'll happily send it to you and uh, yes we'll can send you the peer-reviewed literature after the webinar um, I'll, I'll be in touch with you Tiffany and we'll we'll send you out the research that has been done on the device so far okay so uh, okay so uh, if you have any questions uh, please send those to Chad we're gonna hang out for a couple minutes but uh, Next steps from on our part will, will be we'll share a link to the recorded webinar for those that were here and also those that didn't make it. People, a lot of people registered, uh, but, uh, but uh, several people weren't able to make it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email them to me and I'll uh, either handle them myself or probably more like a layout for them at Ilsa and we'll get her involved with answering your questions. But there's my email on the screen, tom.shone at eagleteye.com, eaglet-i.com. And uh, if you're uh, if you're so totally sold based on this webinar, let's get a quote going, and we'll be happy to send it your way, and we'll get things rolling. But I think uh, I'd like to thank Barry, uh, Dr. Leonard, for uh, his participation tonight, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, we've got uh, just over 20 folks, I think, uh, on the line, and we appreciate your time and commitment. And uh, again, send me an email. Let me know how we can uh, how we can take the next step together, and uh, what, what questions we can answer. Appreciate it. Have All a right. good evening, guys.